make sure that I've got control here. So what I'd like to start off with is the current situation. So I'd like to first point out that it looks like everybody at the Seattle Science Foundation is practicing social distancing. I see Jens with his mask on. The only person I do not see is Rod Eskirian, who's in civilian clothes with no mask. So either he's been infected already or he needs to be arrested. So with the pandemic, uh, a lot of things have happened. And what I'm going to talk about for the next 10 minutes really is the sort of the evolution of, of where we're going with robotics and what, what the future has to hold. But it has become painfully obvious that this has affected every aspect of our life. And the, the, it's not lost upon me in training residents that that is one aspect that is really critically affected. So now in the literature, there's a lot of things coming out. Telemedicine is here. But the reality is we've had a big slow in training. Our residents are afraid, medical students are concerned regarding neurosurgical education during COVID. And when we were on shutdown, we didn't have the, all the resident compliments in the operating room. Their training has suffered. And the reality is that, there, that at some point we have to realize that technology, to your point, Jens, will become an enabler. It seems like only the OBGYN people have figured it out here. Home surgical skill training for for uh, during the pandem pandemic in OBGYN. So I guess if they can practice at home, we're, we're a little bit behind the, the eight ball there. The reality is that, again, in addition to this training paradigm, we realize that there are, there are trainees right now in this age group called the millennials between 26 and 40 are very comfortable with social media. They're very confident. They're a little entitled. They really have, unfortunately, less hours in training. Richard uh, Chua, who's been doing this a long time, gave a beautiful talk about how he's taken a practice of 20 years and evolved into robotics. The reality is this is what's happening right now. And I think the millennials are grasping technology as an enabler, and and uh, you know, if you're learning this from the beginning, that's when things change. But we definitely have less time with them than we had. And this evolution, I like to say, my 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 partners in, in the cranial world, you know, of going from spine surgeon with the compact 64 on our back into using the iPhone is an evolution, and it's happening in front of us right now. We have a very amazing situation right now where. We've got beautiful advances in imaging, surgery, robotics, image-guided surgery, which has been around now and is the standard of care for cranial neurosurgery, has, has been a, slow, a little slower in the spine, but it's picking up. Surgical robotics at the Da Vinci is here. But this nexus between the three modalities of imaging, surgery, and robotics, and I think, as you saw, Dr. Chua, we just very nicely point out how we can bring those three things to bear in the operating room. This concept of automating surgery is not new. It's been around for a while. If you go back to Russia in the 1980s at the Fyodorov Institute, radio keratotomy was done by one surgeon. And you see the patients, he, the surgeon sits down, the patients rotate around, he does the next operation. How amazing is that? Talk about not positioning the patient, but you're sitting down the entire time and the patient's coming to you. Well, we're not going to be doing MIST lifts like that. The reality is that uh, this concept is one of efficiency, and it's for the patient's sake as well, if we can collapse the time of the procedure. If we go back to 1964, glorious days of NASCAR, the car is pulling into the uh, pit stop here. Guys are coming out. They're going quick, a little welding going on. And this is this is what it looked like. You know, let's fix the fender here. He's complaining about that. The guy's going to kick the fender in. This is 1964. <laughs> I saw the open placement of screws this morning, and, and Jens and his team did a phenomenal job. And that is an art, and we all learned to do it that way in 1984. And the fact of the matter is that we can probably do better. And, and those skills, and, and to your point, Jens, of enabling or, or you know, give us an opportunity to do things, I think, with less disruption of the tissues. I do believe we have to have a, a, a very solid understanding of the anatomy, but the reality is we can, we can probably do better. When you go to 2016, you're getting an oil change, four tires change, you know, an overhaul and complete, you know, redo of the car in about 12 seconds. So we've really come a long way. And when we look at surgery in 2020, we've come a long way as well, where I can take, uh, do an MIS uh, surgery and put in four pedicle screws in less than eight minutes with a junior resident helping me. You know, again, teaching MIS was difficult. Learning MIS for me was difficult. Teaching it's even more difficult, but having this type of enabling technology has definitely changed the, the playing field and again, collapsed the time of the procedure. So the goals for robotics are simple. Patients are looking for 
you know, less, we want less radiation. There's a marketing aspect, as Richard talked about, but we want procedural consistency for us and, and accuracy. That's really what we're looking for. For me, this, this, this foray started about 20 years ago, and it was, I was able to, fortunate enough to meet this gentleman here on the left, Neil Crawford, who's a biomedical engineer, my best friend. And we really sort of took the bull by the horns, developed a really the first truly image-guided uh, surgical robot, and uh, you know, taking into considerations the, the surgeon's aspects, right? So this was you know, built from the ground up by an engineer and a surgeon, somebody who's gonna take this into the operating room. So we were, the first case we did was on October 4th, 2017. Now we've done over 200 cases at this point. Now this is the team at Hopkins. And the reality is it is really, for me, has been life-changing personally, not just the development of the technology, but seeing the adoption from our trainees. Being able now to teach uh, surgery in a different way. We're doing MIS surgery, being able to walk through the entire process and literally collapse the training time. And we can sit and talk about what happens when something goes wrong or what happens if things don't work. And, and that's going to be part of the paradigm because right now, if we're doing a, an image guided brain tumor, a small lesion in the brain stem, and image guidance doesn't work, we're not going to open up somebody's head and start looking around. So that the fact is we'll have backups for this technology. But I think the entire paradigm of how we treat patients and do surgery is definitely changing to the point where, as, you know, as Richard pointed out, we can now just make little skin incisions, making that where was the incision was one of the more difficult parts of the MIS surgery is we draw all these lines on the patient's back. But we've definitely made that easier. Now being able to take the arm of the robot, have it hold a retractor, opens up new possibilities as well. And then look at this, seeing implants in three dimensions and seeing instruments as we're doing lateral inner bodies, uh, et cetera. So there are endless possibilities with the marriage of image guidance in our specialty. And it is definitely enabling technology. I'm just gonna show you just a few cases before I get into the last part. These are the cases that we're doing now. This is a patient with osteomyelitis and a collapse. And again, you know, being able to do things part percutaneously and part open is going to change what we do. David Pauly has been a leader in image guidance and robotic, or image guidance, I should say, in scoliosis surgery. The fact of the matter is that, you know, again, can we collapse these procedures? Can we do things in a more minimally invasive fashion? This is a guy with a BMI of 50 with uh, ankylosing spondylitis to be able to repair this fracture in less than an hour with 50 cc's of blood loss. That, that, that's what we should be doing. Tumor cases where we, where we can do sort of a hybrid, make a long skin incision, percutaneously place the hardware, and then in the middle do your decompression infusion. This is a, a patient with multiple myeloma, but a small blood loss and, and very accurately and quickly to, to do this procedure. This is a girl I just operated on last week, a 12-year-old with an infection of the upper thoracic spine, not bacterial, uh, and again, percutaneously going in. And this is a, you know, this is a big operation for a 12 year old. And you know the reality is up out of bed the next day and home in two days after this is really where we should be going. We now have an opportunity as well to increase our, our way that we think about accuracy. Richard alluded to this in the last talk, but at this point, and you can see when we first published our first series, you know, things were not perfect. And there's definitely, you know, some, there were some issues probably with the way the drill tip uh, entered in and we had a bit of deflection. So you see there was no egregious misplacements, but something was up. If you were doing these freehand, you'd say they are, they're all fine, but we're high, holding ourselves to a higher standard. And now we're able to do this with three dimensions. This article just came out this, this month showing uh, basically a paradigm for three dimensional accuracy assessment. So how good are we in three dimensions? And, and the, the fact of the matter is that, you know, in 254 screws, with 100% A or B uh, in the Gertzbein Robin scale, and we're and we're getting better. Talking about workflow very quickly, you know, we, this is another article that was published just about a month or two ago. 28 consecutive cases versus age match controls. And to Richard's point, you know, at a, at a major teaching institution, things take much longer than they do when I was in private practice in Phoenix. But the reality is that, as you can see, very reliably, about four and a half minutes a case. Uh, we had a decrease over the first 28 cases to the point now where the MIS lift is taking less than two hours, and in most cases, about an hour and 40 minutes. So we've definitely gotten uh, better in that regard, and, and that's bearing out. And this isn't a teaching institution. This isn't, this isn't somebody who's in private practice. Um, I want to just quickly show you other technologies now in the last two minutes. 
you know, having intraoperative feedback uh, of where we are in surgeries. We're doing deformity surgery now. We're sort of wed to getting multiple x-rays. But the reality is with, with new uh, alignment technologies, we're going to be able to trace the spine and in three dimensions see how our correction is going at every time during the case. So in other words, having those angles, Cobb angles, PIL, mismatch, mismatch, et cetera, in real time, giving us that feedback as we do surgery. So this is something that's going on. Soft tissue robotics, you know, can we can we repair a dural tear? Can a robot help us with that? And the answer is yes. Let's see is dancing. Ultrasound and spine surgery is, I think, going to be something you'll be seeing. The ability for ultrasound to help us with registration and to help us uh, navigate and confirm our registration. It's been around for a while, but imagine marrying that to what we do. This, I think, is probably one of the most exciting things I've seen, and we're working on here at Johns Hopkins, which is MRI to CT. Everybody has a preoperative MRI scan. Imagine being able to work backwards and make that into a CT so that we, have, we can actually potentially do radiationless surgery for spine. Think about that for a minute, zero radiation. So this is a paradigm that we're working on right now. Being able to see better images is something else. If the algorithm, if the computer knows what the hardware is, this is a post-operative CT, but imagine being able to get images like this with no scatter artifact. Something else that we're working on, augmented reality is here. The augmentic system uh, just recently trial uh, from Israel but the fact of the matter is that having this is an enabling technology, too, for feedback, for teaching, for sure, but in the operating would be helpful. And then what about planning? What, can we automatically plan our pedicle screws? And the answer is probably yes, we can. And the fact of the matter is that we, we just published this paper last year, and it is, you know, have a paradigm where <coughs> imagine being able to have your entire surgery planned by a computer based on your preferences and the patient's anatomy. So that's coming down the pike as well. And then, of course, being able to segment the spine, being able to localize uh, <coughs> devices that move uh, is another thing. Tracking a lot of devices moving outside of an environment is something that we're working on as well. And I think ultimately this all sort of plays into an artificial intelligence paradigm. So we've got a very robust study going on here at Hopkins out, looking at patients' imaging over time. So being able to have x-rays and over the course of the patient's uh, treatment having not just those x-rays, but also having demographic data and robust patient reported outcomes. And then looking at this with artificial intelligence and being able to say, you know, you're planning to do T10 to the pelvis, but you know what? In the last 50 cases, L2 to L5 is probably good enough. So again, giving us feedback on what we do, helping us really make more precise and, if, and really in the true spirit of personalized medicine, utilizing these advanced technologies. So ultimately, to really technology has been a critical part of, of the evolution of spine surgery. We really have been at the forefront. And there is, while there is a learning curve, you know, it is certainly able to be integrated into most people's workflow. It does not require a one-size-fits-all uh, approach. And I think that, that at the end of the day, the important thing to recognize is that we're not going to go backwards. You know, as I look here at my co-presenters, everybody has, has sort of have, has been grasping these types of technologies and gravitating towards them for a reason but ultimately i think we're this is the this is the way of the future so jens rod pat everybody dave thanks for the opportunity to address you all this morning i'm three minutes over time and i apologize and rod i'm not taking any questions unless you have a mask on Outstanding lecture. Thank you, Nick. Um, I love that you shared confidential slides with us. Um, I hope you won't get in any trouble with anybody from a governmental or institutional agency. Rod is w uh, raising his hand, and he's not wearing a mask, but he's in the front row away from everybody, so we'll give him the podium. So, Nick, um, I think uh, this is incredible technology, but I'm going to be very critical of you for once. Um, oh, why isn't there a cl clinic robot? When is that coming out? It's a great point. So, you know, I think with the advent of telemedicine, there are there obviously are things available that you know allow us to you know get into that human interaction. Uh, but, but the reality is that you know doing the neurologic examination is there's really nothing will supplant that hands on when we as surgeons as we examine our patients, but. You can imagine that there will be technologies that will enable that. 
that may help us with an examination, a neurologic examination. I think what we're really waiting for is for you to be cloned, Rod, so that we can make you the first clinic robot. So the, the guys at Hopkins Genetics are working on it, and hopefully we'll have that soon. And then one other question, Nick, is, you know, we have um, a great relationship with the group in Jerusalem. So Bilal Katina is one of our fellows this year, and um, it's incredible to me. In fact, Bilal is going to come up here so you can see him. Um, what I'm a little concerned about and um, is, you know, this is great technology, and it looks really cool. It's like having, you know, Tesla, um, and you plug in your, your Google map, and you're ready to go. And then all of a sudden, you go, oh, shit, there's no reception, or the thing breaks down. And then here you have a bunch of surgeons who've never done open surgery before that don't know the anatomy. So what's the balance? You know, you're in a high-profile teaching academic institution. And where does that, um, is it during training or is it something that you need to get certified in? Because, um, you know, they do, technology sometimes doesn't work. And where do you see that balance? So, uh, great question. I think the, the reality is right, nothing is going to supplant the, the understanding and knowledge of anatomy. How we teach that is going to change. You know, do we do more work on cadavers to get that open? Uh, flavor so that, that the trainees are trained. But I don't think it's going to be justifiable to train trainees on spine surgery, making incisions that are a foot and a half long with four liters of blood loss and seven people going to renal failure and almost dying, you know, after a procedure because of blood loss, because we've got, you know, people in there taking all day and losing a lot of blood. So the issue is that as we get better at what we do, that the, the teaching has to change. So more cadaveric approaches, more virtual reality training, and then ultimately, just like the airline industry, what happens when something fails? We have to have an understanding of that technology, what its limitations are, and how do we train residents to be able to, to react when something happens like that? So those, that's a great question, but I think it all goes under the heading of things are changing. Quick suggestion, Dr. Katane is right here. We'll hear his perspective as a resident at the famous Hadassah Hospital in Jerusalem, and then working with conventional analogous technology here. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Chapman. Uh, actually, in Jerusalem, we use the robot, especially in revision cases, ankylosing spondylitis, grade two, three spondylitis, and in major deformity cases. And I do think that the robot enable easier surgery and pre-op planning than the open and make it easier for us, okay? Now you've seen open, what's better? I will use robot, but uh, <laughs> if it fails, I will use the open. I think, I think the ends, he may think that you're actually a robot. <laughs> <laughs> hey, let me ask one more question, Nick, before we need to move on. So a lot of the focus of robotic technologies, and we'll see it in the lab uh, with Dr. Minista in a second, is uh, really keyed on hardware placement and accuracy and efficiency of hardware placement. And thank you, Bilal, for being honest. Um, <clears throat> you kind of mentioned the soft tissue dissection. Where can it help us in terms of making sure that we have an adequate decompression at this point in time with the current technologies? And is this something that you actually use? I.e., is my stenosis decompression, is my tumor resection adequate? Thank you. Uh, great question. And to sum up, here's the here's the bottom line. Since it's enabled with image guidance, you're going to always have that feedback. But imagine now being able to pre-plan your osteotomy cuts and your drilling, which is really will be the next generation of this technology, and then how that assists you so that where you can make with a bone scalpel or a drill through the robotic guidance osteotomy cuts and uh, laminectomy cuts so that you know that your, your decompression will be good. Soft tissue stuff's a little farther off for us in spine surgery, but I will tell you that the, the general surgeons are way ahead of us, obviously, with Da Vinci, but I think that a robotic assistance in that respect as well will be helpful. So we're going to see some see different things evolving in our field over the next few years. But you are correct. The, the focus now has been hardware placement. You have to start somewhere. I'm very glad to see questions in the chat box uh, arising out of uh, this particular question of uh, how do we do good bone grafting, how do we do good fusion techniques, and how do we do good decompression. So I appreciate those questions very much.